boy on a raft. A young hero of World War II. The raft was six feet long and three feet wide, and there were three of us on it. There was the engineer, with his head badly cut, and myself and Jack Keeley. Jack was a little boy from a poor family in London. The little life raft certainly wasn't comfortable, but it was better than the sinking ship we had to leave. If a ship sinks in 30 minutes, as the Benares did, you don't wait to see if a life raft is comfortable. The first one on the raft was the engineer, who was thrown up on it by a wave. I came later, after the ship had sunk. Then we heard Jack's voice. After a short time, we saw him perhaps 60 feet away and brought him aboard. He had been holding on to a little piece of wood. He had on two life jackets, but very few clothes. He was so cold that his teeth were chattering, but he was very much alive. On the night in 1940 when the Benares sank, a cold wind blew from the north. The sea was rough, and the rain turned to ice as it fell. Once in a while the rain would stop for a few minutes, and we could see the moon. Our ship was torpedoed at 10 o'clock at night. On board the Benares were 406 people, and 100 of them were children, all in bed. 24 hours later 161, including 19 children, had been saved. The rest were dead. If you ever have to get someone onto a raft, and try to do it from the raft itself, the raft will turn over. To get Jack onto our raft, I had to drop into the water and push him aboard. While I was wondering how to get back myself without overturning the raft, Jack said something I shall never forget. On his hands and knees, his teeth chattering, he looked down at me from the raft. I say. He said. I say. Well? I asked, thinking he might have a friend somewhere who ought to be picked up. I say. He said. Thank you very much. The raft couldn't be called snug. One wave in fifty broke over the top. We knew that because we counted the waves the next day when there was nothing else to do. And the waves came up through the spaces between the boards. In a rough sea like that, one of us was always sliding off the raft. Jack was so little that he had great difficulty in staying aboard. So, through the night, we lay on top of him. That kept a little of the cold wind from him too. There were cans of food on board, in a tidy little box fastened at one side. There was even a can opener. But did you ever try to open a can with one hand while sitting on a raft in the middle of the Atlantic with 20-foot waves hitting you? If we set anything down on the raft, we risked its being swept away. That is how we lost one of our four cans of milk. The only time we talked very much was just after one of these canned meals. There isn't much to talk about on a raft in the Atlantic. There is, in fact, only one subject. And that is the subject you don't talk about. Jack, however, did talk about it. After his breakfast of milk and hard bread, he asked questions which were difficult to answer. I say. He demanded. Which way are we going? Well. I said, pointing. We're probably going that way. You see, the wind will blow us along. Yes. He said, patiently. But which way? Are we going to the United States or are we going back to England? No, there isn't much to talk about. Or much to do either, in such a sea. Every half hour or so we would have to move ourselves about a little, because one of us was always about to slide into the water. About noon, when it was warm, Jack and I tried to keep busy by counting the number of gulls that were flying overhead. 
Then Jack went to sleep and I sat looking at the horizon, thinking every little cloud might be smoke from a ship. But there was no ship. Nor any other raft. No longer were there any pieces of the wrecked ship. That was a long, long day. But Jack never once complained. To keep warm, we moved our hands and arms and feet and legs. We twisted and turned. We rubbed Jack. The more we could find to do, the less time we had for thinking about our troubles. But, as hope disappeared, a coldness came over us that not even the sun could drive away. We got careless about keeping close together. We just lay there and thought and dreamed. Sudden danger. The engineer must have fainted. It was all over so quickly that to this day I do not know how it happened. Jack pulled at me. Look at him. He cried. Look. I turned around to find the engineer sliding off the raft. If he had gone, I don't think we could have brought him back again. Little by little, however, Jack and I pulled him back on the raft. Staying together. We slapped him into wakefulness. And then we thought of a new way of lying on the raft with our arms and legs twisted together around one another. This episode woke Jack up completely. He chattered away about this and that for a time. Then he asked me another of his very difficult questions. I say. He asked. I say, how do you stop these things when you want to get off? How, indeed. And when. Heavy clouds were coming up to meet the setting sun. No more gulls flew near us. The wind was stronger and the waves were even higher. There would be more of the rain that turned to ice. I decided we could have no more milk that day, we were down to our last can. A ship? When the warship hooted, I didn't even look up. I had been hearing too many ships hooting all day, especially as night began to fall. I knew by now that they were only the sound of the waves slapping against the raft. The engineer, however, sat up. And slowly, I understood. If two people heard a noise, maybe. It seemed like hours before we rode up on a wave high enough to let us see the ship. And she was going away from us. Like dogs tied up and left behind in an empty yard, we shouted and cried and shouted again. Of course, they couldn't hear us. We knew that. We didn't know that they had already seen us and were sailing on a little farther to look at something that might have been another raft. Suddenly the ship turned around and came toward us, the waves breaking over her. Immediately, we were calm and no longer cold. The ship came slowly up to us. A rope was thrown, but we could not catch it. Another hit me in the face, and we held on to that one. Carefully, we lifted Jack to his feet. He couldn't stand, but, as the raft rose almost up to the deck on a wave, they caught him and pulled him aboard. Then suddenly the raft turned over, and the engineer and I were in the sea again. Getting onto a ship in the middle of the ocean is much more difficult than getting off it. Safe at last. Inside the steaming engine room, a sailor pulled our clothes off. Another appeared with hot milk for Jack and rum for me. The engineer was taken off to bed. Jack and I sat holding hands and grinning foolishly. Try a little of this. I said, putting a drop or two of rum into what was left of his milk. He drank it down. I say. He said. I say, thank you very much. 
Jack still couldn't stop his teeth from chattering. But he didn't cry. He didn't talk about home or about his sister. Later we learned that she had gone down with the Benares. He didn't complain. He had saved his own life by his good sense, and he had saved the life of the engineer. He showed fortitude and endurance, he never once gave up hope. He returned cheerfully to London, which was being bombed day and night. Not bad. For a kid of eight. Jack Keeley, I am certainly pleased to have met you.